Hello, everybody. Um, good, af well, good afternoon or whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Um, I think I'm the sort of warm-up act, really. The main attraction is Ken, um, but I'm, I'm just wanting to go over a few basics about the Ristide Compass. I know some of you are already very familiar with it, so bear with me for, for that for a few moments. Um, and I'll just sort of put in a bit of the background, as it were, to our understanding about risk as well. Um, I think the, the important realization about risk is actually that risk arises out of opportunity. I mean, that may sound a bit extraordinary, but I think that is the case if you think about it. Um, we would view risk as essential or risk taking as, as a key fundamental part of any, any living thing's existence, really. I mean, in order to stay alive from the moment you're conceived, uh, risks begin and you have to find ways to deal with them. So the opportunity is life, I suppose, at that sort of level. But generally speaking, if you want to do anything, if you want to have any endeavor, any, anything you want to achieve, um, then that's, the, that's the, the thing you're pursuing and in pursuit of that you'll encounter difficulties and problems and risks of various kinds. So out of that, so opportunity is the starting point. That creates what, whatever risk you're facing. I mean, of course, there's lots of risks you're not facing that are there and around, but the ones you're facing arise from your opportunity that you're seeking at the moment. And that brings you to decision making, because now you've got to decide whether or not to go ahead and, and go for that opportunity or not. So this is the sort of general pattern of things. So decision making, then, is, is what risk type compass is really all about. Um, the uh, so this that one yeah okay so here's a quote from the, the government chief scientific advisor about decision making this this is just a summary of neuroscience and psychological science over over, over many years it's pretty consensual so his point is that decision making draws on two uh, distinct and separate systems within the brain. Um, and so one of those systems is, is analytic. I mean, that's uh, to say it's cognitive in psychological terms. It's about uh, our need to know and to understand and to make sense of the world we live in. So um, that, that's what analytics is about. The emotional systems in the brain, which are much older, incidentally, uh, interfere with everything in a sense. I mean, our emotional lives um, obviously have a strong impact on things and people vary considerably on both of these factors. So some are much more analytic than others, some are much more emotional than others, and that gives us a various a range of, of um, combinations, if you like, that, that really characterize our risk dispositions. Um, and the other point made here, which is not a big point at this moment in time, but if you think about it, a lot of decisions are made instinctively. Apparently we make thousands, maybe 2,000 decisions a day. Most of those are quite instinctive. It's about whether you've got enough toothpaste on your toothbrush already and things like that. Things you don't really think about how you tie your shoelaces, do up your belt, all that sort of stuff, I suppose. Okay, so the two um, main parts then of um, the profile match, the basis, the foundation of, of profile match is attacking both of those two uh, neurological functions, one the emotional one and the other analytic. So, uh, and here you've got them placed um, 90 degrees to each other and that's appropriate statistically because they are orthogonal, they have no relationship to each other at all. So, I mean, the, the, the analytic scale is blind to emotionality and the emotion, emotional scale is blind to the analytic scale. So emotionally then, you, you range, people range from being intense through to composed. Now, intense then are very emotional. They're people who are highly reactive to everything. They tend to perhaps overreact, but they will react to it, to everything. They've got very sensitive antennae for anything to do with risk. Um, and that would be evident in all sorts of ways. At the other end, it's also, let me say, the intense is all about passion. It's about being passionate. Um, and the composed at the other end are, are people who are much less uh, emotional, much less passionate, um, much less reactive, so hence composed. And those are the people, I guess, that in, in days of yore, uh, when, when people were being selected for high-level uh, army jobs, very often they'd be looking for composed people because um, they will lead the, you know, the Battle of Light Brigade and say, come on guys, we can do it, um, whereas the intents are certainly not going along with you. 
Now, the other, the analytic scale, as I suggested, it's to do with our need to understand and make sense of our world, and some people need to do that to the nth degree, and they're the prudent people. Prudent people are highly organized and systematic, got everything pigeonholed, everything labeled, know exactly where everything is. They detest ambiguity and uncertainty. So that's their end. Carefree, of course, are absolutely opposite. They, they actually de detest things being predictable and being the same as they were yesterday, they like change, innovation, and so on. So that's what the analytics scale is about. So that's the point about this now is, I mean, so that's what we get from the neuroscience. So obviously, you can be anywhere on either of those scales, and you have to account for that. So the next um, graphic here puts in sort of like virtual scales in between the original scales. And that's necessary because you can be both intense and prudent. And if you are both of those things, then you become what we describe as a wary type. You've got two reasons to be risk averse, uh, because you're very anxious, that's the intent, and you are very worried about uncertainty and unpredictability, uh, so you're prudent as well. And then at the bottom, similarly, the adventurous are both carefree and composed. They're people who don't like things to be uh, planned, done by the rule book. They like to, it to be sort of ad lib and spontaneous. Um, and they're also composed, so they've got a very low threshold for what's a risk and what it. No, it's a very high threshold. The risk messages don't get through to the composed very easily. So they've got two reasons why they're adventurous, and that's why you occasionally have these stories of people being dropped into the middle of the jungle with a bottle of um, Evian and uh, a sandwich, and off they go. Um, and then also, the, the two sides, you've got the excitable and deliberately, the, it's the same sort of story. The deliberate the people who are very concerned about organization, but they're also calm and composed. And you've got the excitable people who are both intense and carefree, so they are very alert to risk, but strangely, they're carefree. They're like, uh, and that's, that's quite an interesting one to unravel. Okay, so that, that's basic framework of the risk type compass, and um, this is how it's portrayed in the reports and the graphics. And you, if you're completing the risk type compass, will have a, a dot somewhere in that 360 degree spectrum. I'm, I'm pains to point out, we talk about risk type. Um, but it is literally a continuous 360 degree spectrum and you can be anywhere on it. So when we talk about wary, we're talking about everybody who's from almost intense to almost prudent. And if you're talking about deliberate, then similar, similar sort of thing. And if you're near the center, the axis, I mean, this is important here, we don't label people in the axis because they're not sufficiently differentiated to really say confidently where they are. What If you're in the axis, you're practically in the middle of both of those scales, um, because very, very few people are actually right in the middle. But nevertheless, if you get near to that, then it's silly to give you a particular name. It's more up to the, the person who's been assessed to think about it and take the information that we can give from the assessment to help them understand their own dispositions. And that's a very simple uh, summary of, uh, um, of rather cliched. I mean, the point about that is it's just a, a very simple statement. There, there is huge psychology behind the risk type compass. Some people get a bit worried they only get in one dot, but believe me, if you unpack that dot, there is a huge amount of psychology behind it, um, as there is complex neuroscience as well. Um, now, that's, uh, you know, what I've said so far applies to individuals. The risk type comes we often use with teams, and, and I know we're going to be, cannot be talking about teams to some extent. So um, on the left then is a team report. When we do a team report, we put the cluster of dots on. I'm doing a presentation on, on a team tomorrow um, up in the city, and it will have something like that that we'll be able to share with the participants. On the right-hand side is another graphic. It just summarizes the weight of influence within the team for each. So it's, it's just a matter of being able to discuss within a team. This particular team is dominated by the characteristics of deliberate risk types. Okay, and then this is now uh, some data from a number of different sectors. This is auditors, and it's the way they break down. And as you can imagine, do, you can think, can't you, deliberate. If you remember the deliberate, they're, they're very prudent, um, but they're going to be very calm auditors. They, they're calm enough to sign off on the, the books for Enron, for example, which is a bit of a scary prospect, isn't it? Um, and so they, they're, they're, they're calm, and they 
deliberately know exactly what they're doing, uh, the auditors, and notice how many carefree there are, there are just 2%, and they may not be there still, I don't know. And here's engineers, engineers, well, I, this interpretation is something that you can do as well, isn't it? I mean, at the point about engineers is that they need to be calm, prudent, and deliberate. So it's that side of the spectrum where they predominate, um, because they do also need to be creative, do, you know, in, 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 in terms of their problem solving, if they're civil engineers, or if they're the engineer designers, then they're going to be more on the creative side as well. So you have both of those elements in there. Recruiters, this is where all those carefree people went. Um, recruiters are very high on carefree, so that's because they have to live on their wits, they, they have to get bums on the seats for the, the next assignment, find six people for a shortlist uh, by Wednesday, and they need to work very hard at it, and they do, um, and that kind of tells you they're, they're adventurous, they're carefree, and, and a lot of them are pretty calm too. Traffic controllers were the, the one that really blew our minds when we saw this. This is the most differentiated, differentiated we've come across so far. So deliberate, and you can understand that air traffic controllers and the work that they do, uh, I don't need to go into that, I don't think anymore, you can imagine for yourselves. But I think the point about this graphic is it tells you that people don't go for jobs. The fact that you know the rest of us don't want to be air, air traffic controllers is because we're not like that. And if we were like that, then we might be more interested in doing it. So this is the point. I mean, they organisational fingerprints. We have many of these different kinds of sectors, different uh, different trade, different not trades, professions um, have their own characteristic fingerprint, if you like, in terms of the kinds of people that they tend to uh, to employ. The, the last thing I want to talk about really in any detail is, is just this difference between risk type. Which now, risk type we consider to be really deeply rooted. We can't say it's genetic because you can never can quite prove that. But there, are, there, is, there are genes that are totally concerned uh, with risk taking, in fact. Um, and so we would say it's, it's constitutional at least, and, and we know it's prevalent. It, where, where you are even as a very small child is where you will be until you're about 60. And that's true. And then on the other side, the, the other fact is that we all try to push our boundaries. You know, we're not happy with our comfort zone. We like to push it. It's a kind of a feeling of competence. We feel more competent if we can push our uh, comfort zone a bit further. So everybody is at it. Everybody's trying a little bit more. And they're up for it. And not big steps, but little steps. And so you develop your comfort zone by experience and exposure. So you had a lot of exposure to a certain kind. If this, this particular example probably would be someone put from the financial sector, that's very likely. Um, and so it, if you're in the financial sector, you, you will appear to someone who's not to be taking a lot of risk, but you know your way around. The point about it is if you're exposed to something enough, uncertainty turns into certainty. So in dealing with things and making them more certain, you become more comfortable with them. And that way you make progress. So this answers the question, am I different uh, in my risk disposition in different areas? Well, yes, in your behavior, because you push your comfort zone. In terms of your risk type, no, you haven't. You're just the same as you always were. Here's a, one, just, uh, one example of that is a lot of people are very nervous about flying. I should have had an airliner in here really, shouldn't I? Wrong, wrong picture. But um, if you think about it, a lot of people are very anxious initially on flying. Once they've done it a few times, once they've taken on board the statistics that tell you that you've got a one in a million chance of actually dying and it's much more dangerous going on the local bus, then you get comfortable with it. And, and even so, sometimes the thought that you've got three miles of air underneath you is a little bit scary to most people. That's fairly, that's fairly sensible. Um, but you, you, once you fly um, in comfort, it doesn't mean you change your risk type. Not at all. You, it'll still be the same anxious person that you were before. And the other example I like to give is children riding bikes. Um, I taught seven children to ride bikes in my time. Um, they all ended up riding bikes, and they were good at riding bikes, and you can see that if they, if they had total confidence. They all got there very differently. Some of them just climbed on, pedaled down the road, fell off, rubbed their knee, got back on again, and they're away. And others, it took weeks, if not months, to coax and to encourage and to support um, and to reassure, and they finally get there. That's because they're 
when you, your risk type tells you what you've got to deal with in order to succeed in whatever your objective is, it is, you see. So this is the line, the line of, at the moment. Um, if you remember this from 1939, <laughs> it's when it was written, uh, but you may be up to speed with the Banana Armour version, which I think would probably would be about 70s with it or 80s, I'm not sure. Anyway, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. The risk type, people's risk type is their agenda. It, it determines what they have to overcome in order to deal with what they want to deal with or what they need to deal with. Um, and that's a very good way of looking at it. Just two examples of that. Two people who are uh, Formula One world champions, Nicky Lauda, as we know, who was a guy who was extremely methodical, prepared, and takes every opportunity to minimize risk. He would arrive at the circuit in time. He'd know the circuit inside out. He would study it. He knew a lot about the cars as well and so on. He was very involved in, in the whole process. So that's one person. That's how he got there. This is someone else. You'll know there's a film, isn't there, about this now. But James Hunt, total contrast of, of people. He was very reckless. He lived a wild life with, uh, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll in spades. Um, he would turn up at the circuit and they said, where the hell's James? They would start the race soon, you know, so he'd be there at the last minute. And one story was told by another racing driver. Um, he said to me, well, did you know that when James Hunt was sitting in his car and the mechanics were leaning against it, they thought someone had started the engine because the car was vibrating. That was James. He was nervous. This is a guy who the nervousness and the adrenaline is what drives him. So, you know, we all get there in our own way. All right. Well, then I'll, I'll start out here. Uh, thank you for attending. And this is, uh, my name is Ken Cerny. I'm over in the U.S. So to make this a, uh, an international um, webinar here. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly from, uh, from the U.S. perspective. Uh, so I'll be talking about the FAA, uh, the Federal Aviation, of, uh, and the uh, so it'll be more about the U.S., but it really covers pretty much everybody. Um, it's a little bit about who I am. These are all aircraft that I've flown. In fact, the two on the right are the same exact aircraft, one in 1994, uh, sitting on a ball, uh, softball field waiting for the President of the United States to uh, come stand on the uh, DMZ between the North and South Korea. Um, the same aircraft uh, last year at uh, Heli Expo. Um, all decked out in its nice, pretty colors as a flying museum. Um, that, that aircraft flies around the country and uh, demonstrates uh, something about uh, older helicopters. That's pretty much where a lot of my helicopters that I've flown are, are uh, now on display someplace. The one on the left is the aircraft I'm flying now. It's a Bell 407 uh, in the uh, role of an air ambulance. Um, you know, helicopter pilots and the teams that fly with us, we, we just we are known for taking risks. And, we, and we, we tend to accept the risks the way they are. Um, and most people look at that as, as uh, something, something beyond what they would want to deal with. Uh, I've been doing this for 33 years. And uh, as you can tell, um, there's, there's obviously risk involved here. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today is the type of risks that are taken by helicopter pilots and uh, the crews that deal with them and work with them, um, primarily the helicopter air ambulance crews. Um, I'm going to start out talking about personalities. And this is one of the two things that I did while I was in the military. Um, I was flying helicopters or I was in, uh, in uh, possible leadership positions doing that, but also I was uh, training people. And I uh, got involved with working with personality assessments and looking at how people do things and how people make decisions. Um, Jeff talked about the cognitive side of it, and, and we, I dealt a lot with the cognitive personality assessments. Um, but the FAA had this description, and it, and it looks, it's different than what I've been using for years, but it looks um, and talks about the same thing. We're predisposed to doing things. That's kind of how we were born to be, um, whether, uh, whether it was genetic or we just learned it as we in that, that kind of infant stage and that growing up stage. Then we had an education, a training, a background. They all play into how we make decisions, how we do things, our personality, if you will. Um, and lastly is the attitude that we have that goes along with that. What, 
what drives us? What's what's the thing that that really gets us going, and how that affects uh, the rest of our personality? So, what they show here on this diagram is that three different pilots might have three different uh, backgrounds, predispositions, education, um, and the attitude, and that all equates to how well or how how uh, much we will accept higher risk, lower risk, and so forth. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you know, the, in 2008, the, the first full year that I worked, this is some of the accidents that have, this, this is the ones that that uh, killed people as they went across. And again, uh, you know, a lot of these hit home. Um, La Crosse, Wisconsin is where I was living at the time uh, when that accident happened, uh, upper left-hand corner. So it really got my attention. I started looking at ways that we could, I could do something about this. Um, you know, there's, there's two things you can do. You can complain or you can actually try to do something. So I don't think so. I decided to take my background in personalities um, and looking at people from, from, the, from the psychological perspective, um, even though I'm not a psychologist, I'm, I'm what I call a user. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people that are out there. I'm in this particular study. Um, I started looking at helicopter pilots and medical crew members after I discovered the risk type compass. Um, and once I discovered it, I took another risk and I contacted a few people and finally um, ended up talking with Simon and Jeff about what we could do uh, to get, get some people's attention about uh, the risk that we are taking in this industry. Um, as we went about the business, as we went about the study, um, we kept talking to each other and eventually we came up with a, uh, enough people that we could finally start talking about it and that's where we're at. Um, the general population, um, you get this from, uh, from PCL, um, 7,000 people, they come out pretty much equal um, with the different risk types. The pilots, however, um, you know, there's the equal. Pilots and the, and the crews are a little bit skewed to the right or to the um, east of the, on the east side of the compass. Um, pilots with about 33% deliberate and uh, crew at about 16%. If you add to the pilots, the two that are closest to that deliberate, the prudent and the composed risk types, um, we get up to close to 70%. Um, and we start, we start seeing that there is definitely a, a feeling. Um, and then if you uh, take out the, axi the, the axial group in there, that, that uh, pretty much takes up most of the risk uh, types of the, for within personalities of the pilots. Um, for the crew, they tend to be more prudent and wary. In other words, to the east and northeast, um, side of the risk type compass. Um, and then there's a large group down there in the adventurous down to the cell. Um, so there are a little bit more areas all, all around the area. And I think that's got a lot to do with the job that they have. Most of them come out of uh, ERs, um, emergency rooms, out of critical, uh, critical care units. Um, and they, they now do this job in the aircraft. A lot of them come from uh, fire departments and EMS services um, where they're dealing with um, with uh, just things that they don't know what they're getting into until they get there. Um, and we see that an awful lot. I, I see that an awful lot with what we have. If we look at from a more, from a, from a graphical perspective, and I like looking at pictures that tell me, they seem to tell me a lot more about what's going on. Um, you can see that if you're eating a piece of this pie, you're pretty much going to be comfortable with taking any of those pieces uh, and not feel left out or not feel slighted in the least. Um, they're pretty equal. When you look at the medical crew members, it's a little bit more skewed to the east side, as I said before. Um, and uh, if you get if you are one of the last people and you get the last piece of pie on the left side, uh, it's a little bit lighter. Um, but you can see that there's definitely um, a lot more involved with everybody within the, within the risk compass. Um, the pilots, however, are going to be definitely more skewed to the east side, and the deliberate is the largest group. Um, deliberate, composed, prudent, uh, that's where pilots tend to be, and there's a good reason for that. I mean, there's uh, aviation um, in general is extremely uh, structured. It's extremely regulated. Um, there's, there's, uh, there are ways to do things that are correct, and that's really what's going on on the right-hand side or the, the east side of the compass. Um, and it just makes sense that they're there. Um, you saw the uh, air traffic controllers very much in the deliberate perspective. Um, 
and then compass or the composed and prudent were right right next to those again the, the two larger groups that, with the air traffic controllers um, we talk to them all the time so it just makes sense that in our discussions with their controllers with the with the the way they do things that we uh, follow along with those same rules and regulations now this is a this is a group of uh, there's a there's a single pilot in this group and then there's the rest of them are um, either paramedics or nurses in, a, in the same organization. And this is one base. Um, not all the people from that base are, are associated or are listed on here, but these individuals agreed to be a part of this study. And uh, I knew they were from the same base, so we, we pulled them out. And I just wanted to kind of share with you a little bit of, you know, where, how does this work within a, within a team, within a crew? Um, for instance, we take our pilot. If the pilot is number three, and I'm not sure exactly where the, this particular pilot is on here, but if he's number three, it makes sense. Okay, we, we already talked about the, the pilots being um, deliberate, composed, prudent. That's where they tend to be. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose him. Now, he's a, he's a slight uh, three uh, or a slight composed. Um, and if, for instance, he, the two uh, pre-personnel in the back, the two medical people in the back tend to be number two and four, what we get is you know, completely opposite. We're, we're getting the people on the opposite end of the scales, all working together, all trying to make decisions in the aircraft um, and trying to keep it safe. And um, if they are not able to work together, we obviously could have some very definite personality conflicts. And we see those from time to time. The nice thing about it is if they are, if they are willing to work together, if they do work through their differences, which there are going to be differences, they can find they can find a really good combination of of, uh, of thought processes that can end up making uh, the decision that much better. Um, they work through that. Uh, you know, they're they're going to still have those conflicts. Um, I I deal with a couple of individuals that are exactly opposite of me, and what we find is from time to time we butt heads. Um, when it, but when it really comes right down to it, we, we value each other's thoughts, we value each other's ideas, and those go into the decision making as a crew. And that's really, really the, where the value comes from, knowing um, just kind of where we stand, you know, just that understanding. Why do we butt heads but yet still um, work well as a crew? Um, and that's what we need to get apart. The other part of this is that the farther we are to the outskirts, that the farther we show to the outside of this compass, um, the more likely we are going to demonstrate the more stereotypical um, thought processes and, and ideas of that particular type. And that could just get us into trouble if, uh, you know, if we're both going to hold fast to our ways of doing things. So the team report really does help, and I, I really like seeing this. This is where uh, Jeff was talking about the culture. We can look at the culture of an organization and the small bases that we have um, and so forth. Uh, one of the differences that we discovered with the pilots, um, when we asked them a number of questions, one of the questions was, where did you get your training? Was it military training or was it civilian training? And what we discovered was that civilian training tended to be deliberate but also prudent so they were they probably were showing up on the higher side of the deliberate maybe closer to the prudent and definitely in the prudent area um, and then the the military tended to show up in deliberate and mainly composed um, and those two were you know there's a separation one goes to the northeast uh, the civilians go to the northeast more in the compass and the, and the military goes to the southeast more in the compass and when you start thinking about the difference between the civilian and the, and the military training, that kind of makes sense. That uh, those that are trained in the military are trained to deal with things that um, the civilians that don't just don't have to deal with. Uh, things like the uh, somebody shooting back at you, flying in such a way that you're gonna you're not gonna necessarily follow all the rules exactly the way you are, the way you're taught, uh, because the enemy decides to do something and you're trying to uh, uh, to deal with that. Um, where the civilian side, um, they have you know the rules and regulations. That's the way they survive. They they talk a lot more about um, having to do something because otherwise I'm going to lose my license. Um, I never really, as a military pilot, I never really thought much of that. Um, we knew about you know we 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 thought about 
doing things right and wrong in training. Um, and then in the, in, uh, when things really came down to it, um, sometimes you don't want to do the same things in, in a combat situation. And so we talked a lot more about that, and, and uh, that just kind of seemed to separate us um, in when we looked at the, at the uh, risk types of these individuals. Um, I'm going to share with you a, an accident here um, that happened a few years ago uh, down in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, two Blackhawks that took off, uh, one of them ended up crashing and killing everybody on board. Um, the cause of that spatial, the cause was identified uh, by the uh, National Transportation Safety Board as, as uh, spatial disorientation of both pilots, which caused them to lose control of the aircraft and they ended up crashing. Um, my interpretation of what happened here is the cause of the accident was had nothing to do with spatial disorientation. It had it had everything to do with taking off with a bad decision, um, and that's what I want to talk about here. A little bit about Mojo 69, which was the call sign of that particular individual, uh, the pilot in command flying um, with the UH-60 Blackhawk helicopter. They were going to be flying over water at night under night vision goggles, which this picture is a picture of. Um, and they're going to be dropping a bunch of Marines onto the back of a ship uh, from a hover. So they're going to slide down or, or drop it on off of ropes onto the back of the ship. Um, there was low visibility that particular night, and when they went over over the water, they had no visual reference points, um, which they were still trying to maintain. Um, and that becomes a problem when you can't see anything, but you're still trying to see what's going on. Um, the minimum weather brief was 1,000 foot ceilings. Now that's um, a thousand foot ceiling may not mean a whole lot, but um, to some people, but it, it, that's that's typical VFR visual flight rules minimum. So a thousand foot ceilings, three miles visibility. Um, however, they took off with 300 foot ceilings and one mile visibility. So even though you may not be able to picture that, I, I think most people can picture the the difference in size uh, between a thousand three and three hundred one. They crashed four minutes later. Um, killing two pilots, two crew members, and the seven Marines. There was a second Blackhawk that took off at the same time, but they turned around before they left, before they crossed over onto the water and uh, went back and landed. There's a lot of experience on board, and that, that's really important. Um, obviously, we look for people who are experienced to do these more dangerous missions, and so that's what they did. They knew that this pilot in command, with all the experience he had, was going to be able to get the job done, and, and that's a it sounds kind of bad, but at the same time, as a former uh, operations officer and, and somebody who was would develop uh, missions and send people out on missions, it was important for me to know who was able to get the job done. I, I would be able to choose who I could who I could expect to get this job done safely and, and so forth. Um, my question was, how much did personalities have to do have to do with getting in the way of good decision making? Um, and I, I ended up asking um, through the Freedom of Information Act for the transcript, and I got the transcript, and I started looking at the words and the, and the statements that were being used. The very last statement that was made that was trying to tell the pilot that, hey, this weather is so bad that we probably shouldn't be out here, was from one of the crew chiefs. And his comment was, we aren't going to be able to see the, the boats anyway. He was trying to tell that pilot, hey, you know, we're not going to be able to get the mission done, so maybe we should go back. But instead of saying, hey, we're below our minimums, um, instead of saying, hey, our, you know, we were told, we were, we were ordered to not fly with less than 300 feet, um, he was hinting at it. And there was something that was stopping the pilot in command from taking those hints and making a good decision from them. Um, just from reading through the, the, the description of what happened, um, knowing the pilots, knowing what a pilot like this is like, um, I believe he was a composerist type. Being calm under pressure, high level of composure, uh, very optimistic about his ability to get the job done, seemed imperturb imperturbable, um, unflappable is another way of saying it, appeared to manage stress well. All of these things that show up with the composed risk type might actually be hiding what's actually behind that, and that is the, the amount of stress that this individual may be feeling due to the fact that he's in charge of this whole thing. Um, they've been out there training for several days already. 
They are, they are doing something that's, that's quite different than what they may normally do. Um, the weather is now starting to go bad. They have more than, you know, they have all these people involved. So the stress level may have been getting quite high for them. Um, and he might have been, that might have been masked by this personality type, this composed risk type. Um, the problem is, did the, did the crew, or what I'm trying to get at is, did, did the crew recognize the stress levels that were there? And I'm, I'm thinking that maybe they didn't. Um, and so were they able to help him make a good decision? Now we talk, I'm bringing this back up here, just again, that predisposition is that risk type. Um, what they're able to do, and then the backgrounds in there. And then even more important is the attitude. Um, just did that individual, Mojo 69, was he in such a place where, you know, the, the, the training that might have been there, that people would have said, hey, you know, we're not supposed to be out here anymore, um, didn't kick in at the right time. I want to talk about attitudes for a minute, and then I'll come back to the, to the rest of the Mojo 69 story. Um, Jeff talked about the risk attitudes, and we did, we did get that information from them, and, and I was kind of warned that this really doesn't tell a lot of the story because it's really difficult for us to understand that attitude. This is something that is, is built into an individual. But I just want to share with you a little bit about um, you know, the, the recreational type of risk attitude. This, to me, is kind of a physical uh, risk that we're looking at. Um, uh, American football or, or European football, um, you, know, we're, you know you're going to get hurt out there some days, um, and you, you can't stop that. So you, but you, that's a risk that you accept. Um, you accept the fact that you might break a, break a bone or, or uh, something worse. Um, and so that's pretty high for pilots. Um, we accept that there's, there's risk involved in what we do. Um, on the other side of that is reputational. This is, uh, you know, following the rules, doing things right. I, I talk about it this way. Um, Decision-making processes are good if they are legal, moral, and ethical. Um, that pretty much explains what I believe reputational risk is all about whether you're willing to push the limits on that legal, moral, ethical decision-making. If you're not, if you're, if you're going to follow it where it is, it's going to be lower on the scale. So this is their lowest of the, of the risk attitudes for the pilots in this study. Um, one of those pilots happens to be a composed personality type. He just happens to fall in on the, on the reputational scale at, the, at five. Um, this could very easily be similar to what Mojo 6-9 is. He is not willing to go beyond what he is told to do, the legal, moral, ethical decision-making process. Um, I'm going to come back to that thought in a moment. On the other side, very much capable and willing to take extreme risks um, because they are so comfortable in what they are doing. They've done this for so many years. Um, 6,000 hours of flying time is a lot of flying time, and that's a lot of time for you to get very good at what you do and very comfortable at what you do. And you might get to the point where um, when you see risk, you just don't show that you are stressed. Um, what happens when we get stressed, um, and like I said, may have the, the, the Mojo 6-9 may have been that high recreational and low reputational risk attitude. That makes perfect sense because what happens when you are stressed? Um, the stress effect is, comes from a book called The Stress Effect, Why Good Leaders Make Dumb Decisions uh, by uh, Henry Thompson. Um, he's a, a professor down at the University of Georgia. Um, but basically the stress effect happens when you have chronic and acute stress built up to a point where, it's, where, where you are saturated. You can no longer make good decisions. Your prefrontal cortex at this point shuts down. And this is the decision-making process. This is, this, is the simple, uh, this is the simple yes, no, stop, go, um, place where that those things are made. So if he's in the process of this, conducting this mission, and at the time that he starts that, he's able to do it because the weather hasn't come down yet, he, as he continues on and he starts seeing these things happening, that stress level builds and suddenly it shuts down the prefrontal cortex while he is in the go mode, he can't tell himself to stop. Um, and, I, and I talked to uh, Dr. Thompson on this uh, about this particular situation, and this is how he explained it to me, was you get going, you may not be able to tell yourself to stop. This is, this is the part that does that. 
Um, so how do we get around that? How do we get through that? How do we pass, get past that mental block? Um, we need somebody else to talk to us. We need somebody else to help us out. And so that may come from or should come from somebody else on the crew. And this is where um, it's so important to have a crew that can help you out. Because um, what happens is risky shift. Risky shift is a phenomenon basically where you have a bunch of risk takers and they all seem to work together as a group and they just kind of, they kind of, of uh, they, they take advantage of each other's knowledge and skills, but more so they, they kind of uh, work to uh, make that risk higher for everybody. Um, and this is kind of how local culture, local base culture kind of gets influenced. Another way is excessive professional deference. In other words, we defer to the people that we think know everything. And this particular pilot very much could have that kind of, of reputation within the organization. Or we, we are resigned to follow through and follow along just simply because they're going to do it anyway. Um, all of this leads up to something called the Abilene Paradox, which is our, our inability. Well, here's the Abilene Paradox. It's, it's basically we're all agreeing because nobody is disagreeing. It's not about conflict. It's about not having conflict. And, and so because nobody is really disagreeing, they're just kind of telling us that the weather's bad, we're just all going to go along with it. Um, everybody in the group thinks or knows that something is not right, uh, that something is wrong, the decision is not a right way to go, that we need to do something different, but they are unable to do that. They are unable to take action for whatever reason. Um, they're worried about it. They're worried about their reputation, or the reputational side of risk. Maybe even the social risk may be getting too high for them. They don't want to have people thinking badly about them. Um, they all continue to follow the wrong course of action. But yet if somebody would have said something and would have said it clearly enough for, every, for somebody else, you might find that other people would jump on board with you. Um, Abilene Paradox is kind of the ultimate problem within, within crews. So the question is, how do we take this theory and make it something that can be used to save lives? And the first thing we have to do is provide the knowledge, and that's what this is all about, providing the knowledge of ourselves and our fellow crew members. And one of the ways we do that is through crew resource management training or air medical resource management training, fancy term for communications training. How do we as a crew make decisions? How do we as a crew talk to each other in a way that will save us keep us out of trouble, help us make good decisions. Another thing that we need to do is train. Train more. Train in stressful environment. How do we create a stressful environment that's also safe enough to push the limits? Um, obviously, we train as we go. We are, we're, always, we're always looking for new things. We, if something happens, we try to talk about it. We try to train about things. But how do we do that in a way that we can keep them safe while they're learning the limits of what they have? Well, pilots do that in simulators. We do that all the time. We go down every year. I go and I get with flight safety, and they send me through a simulator, and they make me do all the things that I can't do in the aircraft. For instance, they give me an engine failure. They give me a transmission. You know, they give me transmission problems. Uh, they give me a tail rotor failure, and then I do my training. I react to things that they tell me to, you know, that uh, on ways to, to uh, get out of trouble. Um, medical personnel. They have, they have simulators also. They can simulate pretty much anything that, that can be uh, dealt with in the aircraft um, from, from a uh, failing heart. And so they have, they have dummies and so forth that are really, really high tech, and they can really simulate all this stuff. And then, of course, these simulators can also simulate weather conditions and, and other conditions that might come up. Um, and this is what I call training, in, um, training as, you, as you go. Um, my final thoughts, obviously this has been, I've been talking a lot. Um, we as an industry do accept that what we do is risky. Okay, we accept that. That's a part of the job. What we don't accept is people taking excessive risk or people taking it beyond some of the things. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of regulations involved. There's a lot of, of, uh, of agreements between the organization and the FAA and how we're gonna actually conduct ourselves. Um, how we approach risk is based on our personality, and that's the biggest problem. There's all these personalities. In fact, everybody in that organization is going to be and do things a little different. Even though we have eight risk types, 
we guarantee we, we can't all, we don't all look the same. Um, we don't all do the same things. We don't all come up with the same decisions because we do have different backgrounds. So we need to take advantage of those skills. We need to take advantage of that knowledge provided by these different personality types. That's the great thing about it. That's the great thing about knowing that we have other people on our, on our team that, that think about things differently than we do. Um, and those are things that we need to take advantage of. Like I said earlier, um, two people that are complete opposites might be the best thing you have going for you on a crew if they accept the fact that there are different opinions out there. It's when we don't accept that that we have problems with that. I call it the total crew training program as opposed to the pilots doing their thing, the crew doing their thing. We train in two different areas. We train two separate places. Um, we go down and do our training in a simulator. They go to a group and they, they, they do their thing. Put us together. Find a, find a way that we can do that. And I've been, uh, I've been working on that concept um, in a, uh, a, a mobile simulator that can come, go around to different crews or different bases and work with the crews in a simulator that can be transportable. Um, and we need to make the entire organization a part of this. Um, there's more than just the crew and the aircraft that are this part of the decision making. Um, op operational control centers, uh, we, have, we have people talking to us all the time, we have our communication specialists, um, we have our mechanics. Everybody involved has something to do with keeping us safe and keeping us involved. Um, and uh, bring us home every day. Um, and ultimately, in our industry, getting, getting people that really are having a bad day to where they need to go without making their day even worse by causing a problem on our own. Uh, we do, I am looking for more help with the study. We'll continue this for a while yet. Um, it would be nice to get additional, uh, uh, additional information, um, and you can go to this location to do that. Um, and like I said, this is how you can get in touch with me if you're interested. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, I also have Leader Team Dynamics is on Facebook. Um, that's my small um, business that I do other than flying the helicopters. But uh, uh, thank you for listening and participating. And I'm going to turn this back over if you have any questions. Great, thanks, Ken. That was um, yeah, that was very insightful. We do have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, and they are both for you, Ken. Um, so question number one, um, how did you interpret the proportion of axial participants in relation to the insufficient differentiation mentioned by Jeff earlier on? So I think this is referring to the pilot sample. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And, and, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I find with pilots um, who are um, probably some of the best pilots are pilots who are capable of using the skill level or skills from the other side of the compass. In other words, they don't necessarily, um, some of the worst pilots I've ever known are so stuck in their ways that they will argue every, every point if you bring up something that's a little different from the way they would want to do it. And so what, what happens is as we, as we uh, become more educated, as we have more experience, as, we, as our backgrounds change, as we learn from other people, as we take classes um, like this, as we sit in webinars, all of those things tend to kind of shift, if you will, um, where we might have, where we might be. And and as we get older, I think we tend to be less stuck in our ways, and so we tend to shift more towards the center of this compass. And I think that's kind of where the axial comes out: is a group of it's, it's people who are. Um, very comfortable or more comfortable with moving to the other side of the compass from time to time in order to make a good decision. Um, now the downside of that is, the other side of that is, maybe they become a little bit more wishy-washy, if you will. They, they're not quite capable of, of uh, standing firm in their place. So I've seen that also, where they don't want to create too much conflict, so they're willing to go whatever way people around them go. So. There can be both the good and the, and the bad in that uh, axial position. Okay. That's, that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Ken. Um, and then the second question we have, um, what instrument or instruments did you use previously to measure the personality of colleagues in the aviation industry? Yeah, um, that, that's a good question. I, I uh, When I first started working with personality assessments and, and instruments, 
Um, obviously, the Myers-Briggs was the one that I was initially trained on, uh, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, MBTI, um, in the military. And I use that a lot with uh, senior leaders in my role as the Chief of Leadership Training. Um, at the same time, I was also uh, uh, I also learned a lot about temperaments and, and the connection between personality types and the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator and temperaments. And so as I started working with the air crews, um, they were they were talking about personality in a in a kind of a one line statement of personalities have a lot to do with our decision making, and that's all they were say about it. Um, and then somebody came up and found a personality something or other online, and they they kind of threw that in there. And I said, well, you know, there's a good way to there's a better way to talk about this. And I and I started sharing with them um, a little bit about temperaments, and I and I chose temperaments because it's more behavioral. Um, it's also uh, not quite as difficult to put your fingers around, especially if you don't have somebody who is really comfortable with talking about all the personality types, the 16 personality types. So I started working with temperaments. And as a, the more I worked with temperaments, the more it really worked well with, um, and I used a book uh, called The uh, the I and Team, which uh, Linda Behrens uh, is one of, the, one of the authors of that. And so I started working with that, and, and one of the things that they talk about there is remote teams, and you know, our entire, the company that I work for has 60 some, 70 bases, something like that, around the country and around the world. Um, that's about as remote as they get. Each one of those bases has between, uh, it usually has four pilots for, for, for each aircraft, and then the crews to go with that. And so I started using that, and I, as I, connected and I started working with the risk type compass, I wanted, which, which is based on the five factor model, by the way. Um, and five factor model in the past has never really worked well with some of the other things that I've been working with. Um, what I discovered is there's a connection and I'm still working on this and that's the reason why I didn't really bring it up much. I'm still working on the connection between temperaments and the risk type compass. And if you want to know more, you're, you're, you can contact me directly and I'll talk to you more about how that works. But there's a definite connection between temperaments and, the, and, a, and that behavioral aspect of how the temperaments work. And, a, and actually, I like Linda Barron's new terminology for that, uh, essential motivators. This is the aspect that I feel kind of motivates us to do things that are not really a part of who we are or, or that we shouldn't be really doing or and actually are willing to take things out of, uh, out of the way that we normally would do business. Um, and so uh, that's something that I've been working with. So those are the kind of where I where I have been working with other personality types prior to the risk type compass. And there's a I think there's still a connection there, and I really like that. And uh, even though temperaments and personality types don't necessarily play nice with the five factor model, the way that Jeff and and PCL has developed the the risk type compass, they do play a lot nicer together, and that's really kind of neat. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, we've got one final question. Um, would you care to speculate on any differences in risk type between fixed and rotary wing pilots? Uh, uh, you know, I don't. I don't know if I'm willing to re to to speculate on that. Um, uh, there are there are a lot of differences, obviously. Um, I think. Uh, uh, I think helicopter pilots tend to be more, and I, and I kind of say this in, in uh, part two of that white paper, I talked a little bit about helicopter pilots and the comments that was made by Harry Reasoner years ago being, uh, if you read the whole statement that he puts in there, he talks about you know, helicopter pilots are different from fixed wing pilots. Um, and this was during the Vietnam War, so it's a little bit dated, but at the same time, um, helicopter pilots have a tendency to be probably more Composed maybe than 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 air, air, airplane pilots. Um, if you look at airlines and the way they do business, they are so structured that a lot of decision making is taken away from the pilots, um, simply because there's so much structure involved in that whole situation. So we're looking at maybe more prudent pilots, um, but don't quote me on any of that. Hello, Ken. I've, I've got another question for you because in our discussions in the past, something I think that you said suggested to me that 
um, in terms of approaches to safety, you kind of felt that maybe we're going too far down trying to solve every problem with a technological answer and not enough time developing the people who are actually doing the job. I mean, I don't, can you elaborate on that? I, I think that represents what you've said in the past. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There's, there's a. I have a. Uh, in my in my history of flying helicopters, I've been flying a lot of older helicopters. I've been flying a lot of helicopters that, you know, the Cobra helicopter, for instance. When I started flying that, the Apache just showed up as that that picture shows. That picture shows. As the Apache showed up. Um, it had a lot of technology on it. It was trying to do a lot of things for the pilot. When I was flying the Cobra, the Cobra was a, was a, what we call a pilot's aircraft, and it required the pilot to really, really understand the limitations of the pilot and the limitations of the aircraft. And you had to stay within those limitations. And I talk about the difference between the technology of the Apache, which was an amazing helicopter, and something I actually ended up flying towards the end of my career. Uh, amazing aircraft, but you would you exceeded the limits of the pilot more often than you exceeded the limits of the aircraft flying the Apache and the other, and the Cobra was the opposite way around. You really were kind of limited by the aircraft more so than the pilot. Um, over the years, as I as I got into the civilian world and started flying this helicopter here, the little green one, um, we didn't have any kind of autopilot on board. It's a it's a VFR only, visual flight rules only. We stay underneath the clouds. We don't go up into the clouds. Um, and we didn't have any autopilot. It was all flown by the, air, by the pilot. They did put something on here technologically wise that I really appreciate, and that's they put a simple autopilot on board. They required that of all, uh, all aircraft now that fly in the United States that fly air ambulance have to have at least a simple autopilot on board. So that was, that was one of the best things they could have done technology wise. The problem is they add, continue to add more technology in the, uh, idea that, okay, we're going to give you more things to keep you um, situationally aware. So they want to aware that. So they keep throwing technology at it. I look at it this way. If the pilots are the thing that's broke, in other words, they're making bad decisions, then let's help the pilots fix that problem. Let's help fix the pilots. And we do that by understanding what's going on within our mind, with, with, with how we're making those decisions. And we can't do that without putting more effort into it. The problem is people are really hard to figure out. And so how does the government fix something? They throw out something that should fix it for everybody. If we all do things the same way, we don't ever do things the same way. So let's train people to do things a better way. Thank you, Ken. I think it's great to have your sort of front line and um, a lifetime of experience in, in, in that job and working in, in the things that you've done, both in the Army and, and subsequently. I appreciate your um, contribu contributing today, giving us a, a real life view of, um, which I think is, is fascinating to me. And uh, we may not be near to answering all the questions, but you certainly fed a lot of ideas through to, to me and I'm sure to the other listeners. Well, well thank, thank you, Jeff, you. and Leanne and Simon and everybody there. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be part of it.